So in this part of the lecture, we go into more detail uh, in relation to neuroscience methods. We've discussed some of them already, but very briefly. And here I want to give you some examples from um, prominent studies in the field of neuroeconomics that have used some of these methods successfully. Uh, first off, there are a number of trade-offs between the methods used in cognitive neuroscience or in neuroeconomics, if you will. Uh, and that is the trade-off between spatial resolution, uh, temporal resolution, and the relative non-invasiveness of the of the method used. This is a slide from, from the fMRI book uh, by Scott Utel and co-authors. So you have some methods that have a very high spatial and uh, temporal resolution such as single unit recordings. So these are electrophysiological recordings that require implanting a, an electrode into the brain, but they're also relatively uh, invasive um, and therefore we don't often use them in humans, sometimes in animals. On the other hand, we have um, some methods such as EEG and MEG, that have relatively good temporal resolution, but not so good spatial resolution. So they're in about the one to 10 centimeter range. Whereas fMRI has relatively good spatial resolution. So it goes down to one millimeter and that's improving as the technology is improving. But relative to ERPs or MEG, the uh, temporal resolution is a little bit worse. Although also that is improving as the uh, scanner hardware and software is improving. Then we have <clears throat> some slower methods such as drug manipulations and PET. So these are pharmacological studies here and positron emission tomography here, as well as lesion studies that play out over a few hours uh, or minutes up until in lesion studies, particularly uh, changes in the brain and neuroplasticity um, based on neuroplasticity over weeks up to a year. Um, so the current methods in cognitive neuroscience that are commonly used in neuroeconomics can be sort of subdivided into two types of techniques. We have measurement techniques, and those include uh, neuroimaging, for instance, and they measure changes in brain function. So this is purely a correlational approach. You have someone performing a behavior like these kids playing chess in this picture here, and this correlates, and you observe, while they're doing this behavior, you observe the um, activity in, in certain brain areas. So we have a correlation between the behavior and the neural activity, because we can observe and measure neural activity as we can observe and measure the behavior. Then when it comes to manipulation techniques, you are manipulating the activity of the brain, let's say via transcranial magnetic stimulation, and then observing changes in the behavior. So this is a causal technique. So um, the processing, the neural processing is affected either by permanently damaging brain tissue, such as in lesion studies, uh, or by non-permanently changing the activity of neurons, such as in TMS. And this is a causal approach. And we will discuss this now in the next few slides, but these different techniques provide distinct and complementary information. So while each method has some shortcomings and quite clear shortcomings, when we uh, replicate our findings using different methods, it's actually quite um, complementary information that we get. And this is co uh, called converging evidence. So if we use independent methods in our research, we can somewhat reduce the limitations of each of the methods as long as they support each other or it might obviously also not support each other uh, the results from different studies using different methods and then we have open questions that need to be answered by by future research okay let's talk about some uh, manipulation techniques the first one obviously uh, are brain lesion studies um, and this is showing a picture of phineas gage uh, which is a very famous story and, and that comes up almost in every introductory psychology textbook. So this is a highly intelligent person who was um, helping build railways um, in the early days of the United States. And uh, he blew up 
by accident um he, he triggered an explosion that blew this iron rod that he's it's, it's a tempering iron um, that basically um, led to the temporal tempering iron penetrating his skull in this way that's shown here so he lost a very large chunk of his prefrontal cortex which led to a number of behavioral changes he didn't lose his intelligence but he became a very awkward social person uh, he, he wasn't able to behave properly anymore, especially in social contexts uh, where there was some abnormal behavior uh, that he was exhibiting. Um, now, obviously, he recovered quite well. He survived the accident and recovered, and he actually had, um, from what I read, quite a good life. I think he moved down to Mexico, uh, got married, and, and uh, lived a, a few more years um, after this so this is actually a, a, a nice indication of what can happen to, uh, when brain damage occurs in his case it led to initial changes but later on he he was able to socialize so that, that's also showing how plastic the brain is apparently other parts of the brain were able to make up for the lost tissue or the tissue damage that he suffered from um, and allowed him to live a relatively normal life afterwards what's mostly reported however are these drastic changes in, in behavior that were observed initially in the first two or three years uh, after the accident. So I want to show you two videos now um, that show how damage to a specific region changes behavior. So what you see here in this, in this experiment is a rat that's on the left and what's called a robogator on the right. The robogator is um, well, it's this robot thingy there that's controlled by the experimenters. And you can see the little dot in the middle that the rat is trying to approach. And the Robogator can threaten the rat um, every time she comes out of her little house on the left. And you can see how she react, reacts to it. Um, it's quite clear that she's scared of this predator-like thing there that she doesn't know so well, the Robogator. So she's going to come up one more time and you can see what she does trying to get to the food but unsuccessfully so now this is the same rat about three weeks later uh, after surgery was performed and after she healed from the surgery and you can see that this rat behaves quite differently in fact she's not scared at all and immediately goes for the food item because she's hungry and successfully attains the food item so I usually stop here and ask um, my students what they think the region was that was damaged. But uh, given how informed you are and given the um, novel format of these lectures, the, I'm just going to give you the answer. And obviously this was the amygdala that was damaged here. So let's discuss this region in a little bit more detail from, um, well, maybe not animal studies, human studies, um, human lesion studies and neuroeconomics that have looked at this and one very prominent one is this study by Beccara et al published in the journal of neuroscience in 1999 which is already um, 22 years ago now um, basically what they did they had three groups of, of subjects they had a normal control group there which were or who were that contained participants that were that didn't have any brain damage they had an amygdala group, which relatively uh, with a relatively no, low number of, of subjects because it's difficult to to get these participants, and uh, VMPFC group, also five participants, and then they played a game uh, that's called the Iowa, Iowa Gambling Task. I'm going to show this to you on the next slide, um, and this task basically uh, by experience, so by learning, by picking up cards, um, you learn that there are some good decks and some bad decks in the set of cards that are in front of you. So as a participant, you face these four card decks in this game. Here they're just called A, B, C, and D, but they, they have some distinguishing um, features that, that you can pick up as the, as the participant. It could be different colors, or it could be indeed these kinds of letters. And every time you draw a card, you either get uh, a win or a loss. And in the, in the game deck, uh, well, in the good decks, 
you have relatively small wins. So in this case, $50, but this is just one version of the task that has many different versions. Um, and you can also incur, incur losses on average over 10 cards. These losses in the good decks are $250, but the losses in the bad decks are actually quite large. They're $1,250. So uh, since you're gaining something and you're losing something, this means that you have a net gain in the good decks of $250 and net loss in the bad decks of $250. But there's some other features that, that vary. Um, remember that the bad decks might actually be attractive because they lead to large losses. Uh, large gains initially of let's say a hundred dollars so when you draw the first card let's say you get a hundred dollars you think as a subject oh this is great then you draw another card you get a bit of a loss you think ah it's not so great they keep drawing and then uh, you have to learn across those four decks which ones uh, well basically are the bad decks and which ones are the good decks and this is these graphs down here are actually showing um, how these participants did so the normal controls they pick up that some decks are disadvantageous that's shown here and they stop choosing cards from them and they pick up that some decks are good and they start picking more and more cards from those this is not the case for amygdala patients um, and it's pretty small here um, it seems to be not the case for vmpfc patients either um, but they seem to be able to somewhat distinguish in the end so you can see that on average um, the healthy controls start behaving normally they they uh, well advantageously whereas this is not the case for the amygdala patients here and this is showing the skin conductance responses um, while they were uh, selecting a card um, and you can see that in normal controls, when they were taking a card from disadvantageous decks, they were a little bit nervous, they were a little bit aroused, indicating that they implicitly had learned already, um, maybe towards the end of the task, somewhat explicitly, uh, that this might lead to a large loss. So, so they showed some, uh, well, anxiety-related arousal here or risk-related arousal. This was not the case for both amygdala and VMPFC. And this has... Um, this evidence here has been used as uh, evidence for the somatic marker hypothesis, which uh, Becara and Damasio both proposed. Okay, moving on, there are some more recent studies from, from 2010 here by DiMartino et al. that used a gambling task. So in each trial, these participants had to make a choice of whether they want to flip the coin or not. Flip yes, flip no, it says here. Um, and the interesting part about this test was a very simple choice. Do you want to play this lottery or do you want to keep the money you've earned up until now with no change to it, basically? Uh, so they have some endowment that they get before they start with the experiment. And the interesting part here is that the win amounts and the loss amounts are varied on every trial. So this is a lottery where you can win 32 and lose $44. It's obviously not very attractive because you can lose more than you win at a probability of 50%. This one here is much more attractive. You can win much more than you can lose. So you might consider playing this one. So it's worth taking the risk here uh, because you can win almost twice as much as you can lose. And then by varying these all of these amounts, uh, you can identify, so in the domain of losses as well as in the domain of gains, uh, you can identify the loss aversion um, of, of the participants. And this was done also in... Uh, two patients with amygdala damage and then a number of, of matched control participants. And what you see here is uh, this heat map that shows a gradient of the probability of taking a gamble, where black means the, the, the likelihood that these control participants took this gamble is relatively low. And the uh, bright colors, so um, yellow and white, mean that it's very high. So this is a gradient that we commonly observe in um, normal uh, normal participants where when losses are high, obviously you don't want to play, play this gamble, but when gains are, are high, you want to play this gamble. Um, and this is reflecting their loss aversion, basically. You can see that the patterns are quite different in the uh, two patients with amygdala damage, SM and AP, relative to the um, control subjects, where they show a much higher amount of loss aversion 
uh, compared to the amygdala um, damaged or uh, the, the patients. Uh, because they also accept some gambles with high losses and low gains, right? Such as this one here. There's a non-zero probability of taking this gamble. For this participant, that's not the case. Uh, but you can see that there are some some deviations where in this diagonal, this participant is actually having much brighter colors than the control participants. Showing basically that in this paper, what they found is that if the amygdala is damaged, you have lower levels of loss aversion um, or higher higher um, loss neutrality in these participants. Then there are other ways of manipulating uh, the brain. Obviously, we've discussed this earlier, such as this transcranial magnetic stimulation um, illustration. Well, such as TMS, which is illustrated here in the um, in the figure on the right. As I said already, this uses a strong magnetic field, which is applied to a specific part of the brain with relatively good accuracy. Uh, this magnetic field passes through the skull and generates an electric current inside the skull, which triggers neurons, basically. It's, it, this, this current acts on the underlying neurons and then triggers action potentials. Um, basically, this leads to depending on how you do this and how you stimulate, there are different stimulation um, mechanisms, if you will, uh, where uh, you stimulate at different um, frequencies. Um, and this then leads to, under some stimulation um, protocols, to an exhaustion of the regions under, under the uh, coil. Um, the region that, that you stimulate the neurons basically get exhausted and they don't they don't uh, fully function for about 30 minutes or so this then leads to um, changes in behavior that you can observe as an experimenter um, and it gives you a, a causal influence of this region on behavior typically in, in these types of experiments you also include a control condition where you stimulate in regions that are uninteresting to the current research, or if you have bilateral regions, you can stimulate both the left and the right and see how how stimulation there differs um, or differentially affects behavior. And finally, uh, you can stimulate in regions where there's um, not so many neurons, um, such as, let's say, between the two hemispheres. Um, here's a study that's, that's relatively um, prominent in neuroeconomics where uh, they asked subjects to play an ultimatum game after the uh, prefrontal cortex was stimulated. And uh, what you can see is that after left DLPFC was stimulated, so they, they uh, stimulated the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, this region right here. Um, when the left is stimulated, there's no change in ultimatum game acceptance decisions. However, uh, and these were unfair decisions, right? So they're only a specific type of decision that was highly unfair. Uh, relative to sham, so in the control condition, these two, uh, these two stimulation parameters don't uh, cause a change in behavior. However, when the right TMS was stimulated, you can see that there is quite a significant change in behavior with acceptance rates of unfair offers going up to al almost 50%. While at the same time, participants quite well understood that these offers were unfair. So they gave about the same fairness ratings. So indicating basically that uh, the right DLPFC is particularly involved in, in making these types of unfair ultimatum game decisions. And if it's inhibited and doesn't contribute uh, normally to the decision process, then you see abnormal behavior in this case. Um, and finally, we have transcranial direct current stimulation. This is how it looks like. Um, it's basically uh, this the stimulator that has an anodal and a cathodal stimula uh, stimulation. Um, and it applies a constant low current to the brain side of interest. Anodal TDCS leads to depolarization of the resting membrane potential, uh, which means you have greater neuronal excitability. And 
basically an upregulation of this of this brain area and catodal TDCS leads to a hyperpolarization of resting membrane potential. This leads to the opposite, to a suppression of brain regions. Uh, so there's some debate about the usefulness of this method, but uh, again, this method is also being developed only recently and uh, it's also been applied to some interesting um, settings such as this one here this is showing the um, the SNS lab, the social neuroscience um, lab in Zurich, where a number of participants are playing interactive games and all of them are simultaneously receiving uh, TDCS stimulation. Okay, let's look at the strengths and weaknesses of TMS and TDCS. So both are causal approaches. This is uh, obviously a strength that they have because you can make causal inferences when you stimulate a certain region, when you upregulate or downregulate a certain region. Um, it gives, and, and then you can observe changes in behavior. It gives you a causal understanding of the role of this region in behavior. They have uh, good temporal resolution, high spatial resolution, and they're relatively non-invasive. TDCS has the additional strength that it's relatively cheap and easy to apply and can be applied to multiple subjects simultaneously. That's much harder with TMS, which uh, may require um, a little bit more work per participant, especially if we use neural navigation, which allows you to apply to specific regions. But then it's also more accurate, right? Um, some of the weaknesses are that it's only possible on the cortical surface. So if you're interested in um, stimulating regions deep down in the brain, like the striatum, which we are interested in neuroeconomics or the VMPFC even, that's a much more difficult thing to do. Um, and there's some noises. So every time you stimulate, it goes duck, 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 duck. Um, this can be quite distracting for the subject. In fact, it also makes it uh, a bit harder to, stim to have a controlled stimulation where you do not stimulate at all. Um, then the weakness of TDCS is that it's sort of a diffuse stimulation that, that sort of diff diffuses non-linearly throughout the brain. So you have one electrode here and one electrode here. And obviously somewhere between these two electrodes, there is a flow of electrical current, but um, you don't know exactly how that flow uh, occurs and, and how it affects different brain regions, possibly differentially. And the effect is obviously lower uh, compared to TMS. Okay, then let's move on to observation methods. So the first one that we've talked about already is electrophysiology. We have single unit recordings here. They actually, again, they involve implanting electrodes into the brain, as you can see here in this red. So um, in fact, they implant the electrode together with sort of a recording uh, plug that allows you to, to plug this uh, electrode into then um, the apparatus in this case. Um, this is commonly done also in monkeys, as you'll see in the next slide. Uh, but the wonderful um, advantage of this methodology is that it records neuronal activity directly from the neuron or from or the activity of a few neurons simultaneously by um, actually placing the neuron in the site that you're interested in. Um, and directly recording action potentials from this side. And you can see this here. This is basically the kind of data you get from this. Each um, spike here is actually an action potential being fired by the neuron, which is quite uh, wonderful and probably the best way to observe actual neuronal properties or neuronal firing rates while an animal is behaving and makes interesting decisions. It's highly intrusive because it requires the insertion of very fine electrodes into the neural tissue. Um, and it's only possible in animals and humans undergoing brain surgery and only obviously with their, with their consent in this case. But it has led to some of the most um, important discoveries in, in neuroeconomics, such as the observation of the reward prediction error. And I know that this is a slide that many of you have seen already, and it's also a slide we'll discuss in the neuroeconomics lecture again, but this is just to show you that this is commonly done in, in monkeys. So this is monkey electrophysiology. The monkey sits in a chair, receives a reward, 
um, and sits relatively still but is able to perform a relatively complex task by pushing a lever, lever or interacting with a touch screen nowadays while um, recordings are being taken from interesting regions, interesting neurons within the brain. Um, and this is again, this is showing the reward prediction error, but I won't go into this uh, into too much detail today because we'll discuss it in the future. Then another form of um, electrophysiology is electroencephalography, uh, where participants are um, basically wearing this sort of cap with many different electrodes placed around the brain, but in specific regions of the brain. So but for experimenters know exactly um, well, not exactly, but approximately what regions each electrode is above. Um, and what this allows us to measure are basically the collective electrical action potentials or currents that are caused by the upper uh, action potentials um, that proper propagate all through the brain uh, to the scalp. So this is basically taking the electrical activity that we can measure and observe right at the scalp. Um, so it's also a wonderful method that is non-intrusive and allows us to observe brain activity in different states, which show quite different um, brain waves, if you will. So the excited one is very spiky. The relaxed one uh, then is, is much more um, white in a sense. Um, and then you have different types of, of brain waves during different arousal states. Similar to this, we have magnetoencephalography. Um, where basically it's also picking up electrical currents, but not directly, but more indirectly, namely the magnetic fields that are produced by the electrical currents within the brain. And to do this, it uses um, superconductive quantum interference devices. They're called squids. There are multiple of these devices uh, located inside of the MEG machine or the magnetoencephalograph. And um, they're extremely sensitive, so sensitive that it will pick up a closing car door uh, quite, a, quite a distance away from, from it. So it has to be housed in a shielded room and it's relatively uh, expensive. It has better spatial resolution than EEG or ERPs, electro, um, electroencephalography. And uh, Again, it's questionable whether the cost-benefit ratio is is, um, is there or whether that works in its favor because they're quite costly still. So let me give you an example of an EEG study that uh, used EEG to distinguish neural responses to reward magnitude versus reward valence. So the task is relatively straightforward. You have a choice period, the chosen outcome is shown and the alternative outcome is shown. During the choice period, you simply choose, or as a participant, you would simply choose whether you pick the left square versus the right square. Then there's a short period that shows you, gives you feedback, and then another period where you find out how much you won or lost. Um, and the wins and losses can be a different mag magnitude. So they can be small, such as this win here, or they can be large, such as this loss here. Um, and then what's done here is they looked at the EEG responses, these are called ERPs or event-related potentials, which is basically you align all the observed trials that you've, that you've recorded now from your EEG signal for the entire experiment. You align them to the onset of the trial, so this is the beginning of this choice period. And then you see that, uh, and then you can average them and you get basically this average response in each condition and you get a sort of a standard error around this response in each condition that allows you to make comparisons. Mm -hmm. And in particular, you can look at the P300, which is shown in the small uh, box here, or what's called the feedback negativity, which is shown in this larger box here. So that's what they're doing here. And they're showing that the P300 distinguishes between whether something was of small which is the thin lines, small win, small loss, um, relative to the thick lines, large win, large loss, magnitude. So this is distinguishing or differentiating between the magnitude of the outcome right here. Uh, so we're basically looking at the onset of this, this outcome here. 
Um, and we, we, we're seeing here that in this study, the P300 is distinguishing between the magnitude of the outcomes. But at a later time point, uh, it's actually distinguishing between the valence, so whether it was a win or a loss. And you can see this by the differential response to the uh, uh, um, white lines, which are the wins, and the black lines, which are the losses. And you can see this both for small and uh, small amounts are down here and large amounts up here. You can see that the uh, neural response differenti differentiates between these two lines. So you have a dissociation between the magnitude, which occurs at the P300 uh, stage, and the um, valence of the outcome, which occurs at the feedback negativity stage just a few milliseconds later. And this shows one of the um, wonderful things about this methodology, which is the, the really high temporal resolution. Um, which brings me to the strengths. So um, when we compare single unit recordings, EEG and MEG, uh, the strength of single unit recording is that it's directly measuring neuronal activity and it has the best spatial and temporal re uh, resolution of any of these measures. The weaknesses are that it focuses on single brain regions, so not like fMRI where you observe the entire brain at the same time, or EEG and MEG, but you're only focusing on single brain regions and it's very invasive. And the data collection can be very slow and labor intensive because it takes some time until you find a neuron that you're interested in with the exact properties of that neuron. EEG on the other hand has still has high temporal resolution. It's non-invasive. Um, you can average responses so you can, uh, while each individual response is quite noisy, you can obtain multiple responses and then average across these. Um, you can observe oscillatory uh, activity, for instance, like in sleep studies. It's relatively inexpensive and broadly applicable. But it has a poor, poor spatial resolution. Um, and it takes a little bit of time to set up these caps to make sure that the, the electrodes are positioned above the regions that you're interested in as a researcher. MEG also has high temporal resolution, better um, spatial resolution than EEG. And it records data from the entire brain simultaneously, but so does EEG in a sense, just not from possibly subcortical areas. At least it gets difficult to understand where the source of your signal lies with both EEG and MEG, but a little bit less difficult with MEG. Um, there are only a few MEG systems available worldwide. One in the Netherlands is at the, at the Donders Institute, and there are still some limits in spatial resolution and the identification of exact uh, location of activity um, remains a mathematical, unsolvable problem. Okay, let's move on to PET, positron emission tomography. Uh, again, it's a bit more invasive than fMRI, let's say, because it requires the injection of a radioactive substance, a radio tracer into the bloodstream. Um, the radio tracer is taken up by brain regions according to how active they are, um, so it's, uh, you inject the radio tracer into the bloodstream, uh, you wait a few minutes, and then you have the subject perform the task in the scanner. And um, depending on which regions are active, especially if, if the tracer is attached to glucose, uh, which is a metabolic substance, well, basically sugar that the brain needs to produce action potentials, then those regions that are active receive more glucose, uh, which is delivered there via the bloodstream, and you will, we will see that they become more active. And the scanner then detects these types of concentrations. Regions that are more active will have more of the tracer present and will be more radioactive. And this will be detectable um, by the um, equipment. There is uh, a study that is, um, well, relatively... Um, Successful. It's a study by de Quervain et al. In, in Science, published in 2004. We'll discuss it in more detail in the neuroeconomics course. But what they found is that when people were interacting with someone who was unfair to them in a trust game and got to punish them afterwards, then activity in the striatum, 
here is this is shown the, the this is the uh, chordate nucleus shows um, is increased and uh, correlates with the amount that was invested by the participant into the punishment uh, basically showing one application of of pet imaging in neuroeconomics but these applications are becoming less and less uh, common more recently um, okay let me stop here by briefly summarizing the um, pros and cons, the strengths and weaknesses of fMRI and PET. Uh, both are non-invasive in a sense, <clears throat> but fMRI is obviously a little bit more non-invasive because you just stick a person in the scanner and no additional uh, well injections are necessary. fMRI is a high spatial resolution, which is getting higher with uh, technological development and has a good temporal resolution, which is also imp improving as the uh, hardware and software improves. Weaknesses are they're all correlational, both PET and fMRI. Um, relatively expensive to maintain a scanner um, and the signal is noisy and you have dropouts in, in many, well, not in many regions, but in some regions. Uh, PET has additional strengths. You can actually build radio ligands for some more interesting um, neurotransmitters and you can then image the activation of neurotransmitters. Um, it has good spatial resolution. However, given that you have to inject uh, this radioactive tracer, it's relatively invasive. It's correlational. Uh, it can be costly to produce these radio tracers and you have to have a chemistry lab nearby that can help you make this radioactive tracer um, because the half-life of these tracers are quite short, so you have to transport it from one side to the next quite quickly before you inject it. Okay, um, next I'll talk about the focus in fMRI. For now, though, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please email me. Um, you can reach me here at jvengelmann at gmail.com.